This episode of Behind the Video is brought to you by the Independent Media Network. The Independent Media Network helps journalists and content creators create their own jobs by building sustainable online businesses. If you're an unemployed or underemployed journalist or content creator, visit imnct.com for more information. Hey everybody, welcome back to Behind the Video. This is episode number 57, and joining me as always is Tim Street, who is in a secure, undisclosed location in Comic-Con, so uh, all of you sci-fi warriors will not be able to find him. Tim, what's going on over there? Hey man, it, Comic-Con's crazy. Like, I, I, I have yet to make it out of the hotel and uh, to the show floor. Uh, I don't know if I'll get there today or not, but uh, I, I've been looking at tweets and... Uh, all kinds of wacky stuff is going on. Uh, you know, Walking Dead seems to be dominating a lot of the conversation, but there's all kinds of, uh, you know, independent content creators that come to Comic-Con, and they uh, they have little parties on the side to promote their whatever they're doing. They give out stuff along the way and, uh, you know, use social media to uh, get people to come to uh, their events and promote uh, their series. So, you know, folks like Bernie Sue are are here in San Diego as as well as uh, Frank Krueger uh, is uh, promoting uh, Darkness Descending and there, there's quite a few other folks that are here. Tara Platt is uh, here uh, with Shelf Life and uh, uh, you know it, it's a great place to find people that are interested in uh, interesting content that appeals to uh, folks that are into the geek culture. And there's a lot of there's a lot of money marketing money, especially by the the bigger studios invested in into this event. So I, I would imagine that these are the kinds of people that can really spread the word about something cool that they might like, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, a lot of people feel that it's oversaturated now and that it's too big and that you're not able to do the things that uh, you used to be able to do. That there's just a little bit too much noise, but uh, there's definitely a crowd here and there's a lot of people interested. And, and, you know, geeking out on, on whatever's new. And, you know, other people like uh, Greg Benson with Mediocre Films will come here, and Greg makes content while he's here. So he'll go around and shoot all the different booth babes and do interviews with folks and then put that up on Mediocre Films. So, There's a uh, lot of content creation opportunities just in covering the event, too. And I, I, it is kind of a, it is a show in, of a, there's a show in the show, right, of all the people who attend in costume and everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people spend a lot of money getting dressed up for Comic Con, and and uh, you know, put months and and hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars into creating costumes uh, that they walk around. And and so the cosplay is is a lot of fun and and part of the culture. Uh, so there's different meetups that that happen, and then there's other events too where we're kind of the the uh, you know. Folks like Kevin Winston will do uh, digital LA events where there's a meetup for folks that are in digital, and uh, so it's it's definitely a convergence of different worlds. It's not just about comic books. Yeah, it is. It has certainly become a lot more than than comic books. So, who would you dress up as if you had the opportunity? Well, I I think with my current look, it would be an evil villain <laughs> of some type. Make up um, your own, probably. Right? Probably from a Spider-Man uh, episode of the 1960s, you know, with a little Stan Lee flair to it. There you go. That that could work uh, very well. So cool. Well, maybe next year you'll uh, you'll indulge. But um, our our web series of the week is is related to this topic. So what? Tell us about um, Shelf Life series. And I guess this is superheroes on a shelf, kind of a Toy Story thing, but but live action actors, right? Yeah, Shelf Life was uh, created by Tara Platt and uh, her husband, uh, Yuri Lowenthal. And what it is, it's a couple of characters that are dressed up and they're always on a shelf and different things happen in the room that uh, they're in. And so they uh, definitely uh, have some fun with it and uh, you should check it out. I will check it out, and uh, don't worry about the noise, everybody. Tim is uh, in, a, in a lobby working, so uh, you sometimes hear some some kids out there. So it seems like a pretty cool show, definitely fitting with the Comic Con theme of the week. And uh, so, you know, Tim, last week we were talking about the Google Glasses and how they were ridiculously expensive, and how I'm sending them back to some pretty much where they came from, but get my money back. But the um, uh, there is a new uh, thing that I tried out. I mentioned this last week, and they came in. Um, I bought these with my American Express points. These are the uh, uh, the uh, pivot head sunglasses, and 
they have a little camera. I don't know if you can see it right on the top above the nose. And so it, these these glasses for people listening audio wise, they kind of look like uh, the Terminator's glasses. Uh, they they've got mirrored lenses and then uh, turned sideways. Let me see them on the side. They're, they're kind of thick on the side. They look like Oakleys maybe. Um, and then what do they have? A, a, a card in them, removable card, and some batteries. Uh, it has it? No, it actually has internal memory, so it's got about eight gigs of storage. It stores an hour, and I think the battery will get you, you know, pretty much get you there. I haven't really run them for an hour straight, but and and what do they? They record 720p. Uh, 1080p. So you get 1080 at 30 frames per second. So the the video uh, resolution is a little bit better than uh, Google Glass might have. And I I did a review. Um, it should be up on my channel later this week on, on the Lon Seidman channel. Um, isn't that cool? You can have your own channel in this in this century. Um, it'll have uh, you'll have a review of video quality comparing one to the other. I actually put both on my head and then synchronized them up in Final Cut so you could kind of see a, a head to head with them. It looks pretty much the same. Um, the they're not as wide of an angle as Google Glass, but it doesn't you know it doesn't really take anything away from it, and uh, the quality is decent. So. Um, what, what about the, is there some type of motion uh, stabilizer? Do they shake around a lot? I mean, when you move your head, is it smooth? It, it isn't. No, you've got to really think about what you're shooting. And the one disadvantage with these things over the Google Glass is that uh, Google will, the Google Glass will display what you're seeing into your eyes so you can kind of frame your shots a little bit. This thing doesn't have that, so you need to... Um, is, there's going to be some trial and error in learning exactly where that camera field of view is. And, you know, I was doing some experiments where I was looking down at something and I wasn't looking down far enough. So um, it takes a little bit to kind of get used to how they work. But, um, you know, there's certainly, like I said, you could buy five of these for, for what one uh, Google Glass will cost. So um, there's, uh, there's definitely some cost benefit to it. And, you know, it, it, you really do not want to move around too much because it will pick up all that bumpy movement. The, the glasses do too, for that matter. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is the sensor seems a little bit slower. So if you make a really sudden turn of the head, you'll get that jelly vision thing going. It's not terrible. Uh, it's not as bad as I've seen on, on some other products out there, but you just want to kind of play around with it a little bit. I think it's, you know, it's ideal for very limited applications. I, I found them really helpful for um, some of those product reviews that I do, especially when I'm outside and I want to handle something with both hands. That, that, that's been really, uh, been really useful, which was why I decided to go ahead and what, pick up a what pair. About, what about, um, what other features do Google Glass, uh, what do they do that, that, that this pair of sunglass camera doesn't do? You know, from a video perspective, I think they're pretty much about even. Um, the Google Glass, like I said, has a little bit more of a wider field of view. I, th I think it captures what your eye sees a little bit better, um, and you have the viewfinder. But beyond that, I mean, it's really not all that different. And you know, they're they're pretty well but built. Beyond just video, what else? Oh well, you it, in the Google Glass world, you've got you know. Uh, essentially a cell phone attached to your head so you can do email and, and respond to things and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, you do gain a little bit more of a, of a, of a cell phone, smartphone kind of functionality with the Google Glass on your head. Um, these are certainly not internet connected, which uh, the, glass, the glasses are. So, um, you, know, you do miss out on some of that, you know, gee whiz functionality. But at the same time, your phone in your pocket if you have those on your head and you have a phone in your pocket, you have Google Glass. <laughs> you just you don't have it in your head. So um, you know those are those are kind of the uh, the differences there. But you know it's a good it's a good little little toy to have if you're if you're in the need of that first person perspective. And they do fit pretty snugly. So I, I think you could you know jump out of an airplane or something with them and not uh, risk losing uh, losing your your equipment. So pretty pretty neat stuff. It's good, good to know because you know every once in a while I feel like jumping out of an airplane. So. <laughs> At least I have a way of recording it. <laughs> exactly. You have a way of documenting that on your uh, your way down to the ground. And I, I actually, my, my first uh, foray with these things is uh, we, we talked about that drone uh, last week. So yesterday I decided to go uh, fly the drone out in a more open area and I sent it up as high as it could go. And, and it was, uh, I did a little multicam with, uh, with the drone and with the glasses. And I also picked up the drone crashing from 300 feet. So that was uh that was a, a really fun thing to watch. So, yeah, it's uh, not up on your wall. Is it up on your wall anymore? Uh, it's, your yeah, or just it? oh, it is. Yeah, actually. Oh, yeah. there. Oh, there it is. That's the frame. Yeah, the drone yeah. itself is um, actually survived the crash, believe it or not. But uh, I had taken it down to the studio to do uh, do a little follow up video. So, um, cool stuff. Really fun to play with. So, lots of toys at my house this week. But um, speaking of toys, uh, YouTube top channels 
Sky Does Minecraft is still up at the top, but a new one has crep- cropped into the top five list. On number five is uh, Rooster Teeth, which is the Red versus Blue channel, right? Right, Bernie Burns. Bernie Burns has been doing Red versus Blue for, I don't know, 13 years now or something? It's yeah, crazy it's been long a long time. time. And, and so he owns the... This is a YouTube channel that he owns. Like he he's doing a, a multi-channel marketing deal. Yeah, Rooster Teeth is his. I don't know if he has partners or not, but uh, definitely somebody out of Austin, Texas, who's really uh, made a name for himself in web video and you know one of the pioneers in the space. Pretty cool. So that is uh, he's moving up and and uh, you know I think uh, you just yeah you, know, you you get some good stuff going and there it goes again. Video game content focused on younger younger audiences. Uh, number four is the Ellen Show. I would bet you that a bulk of those video plays that she's getting is not from direct YouTube links, but uh, probably embeds in other places because that's a much different like, audience. She just put, puts it on her uh, her website. Yeah, I think so. You know, she's directing people back in, and maybe it's it's. I don't know. I'm just speculating, but it just doesn't. It just seems to run counter to what I've seen on the YouTube audience charts here. So, um, movie clips, trailers, certainly a big week for trailers well, with the, everything. The other thing. Mm-hmm. The, the other thing, too, on Ellen is that she does a lot of hidden camera, and I, I think that's a key word that's searched a lot. So people uh, will stumble across that and, and watch her hidden camera videos. You know, uh, Candid Camera got people interested in that type of content. Right. That's very true. So she's probably banking in on uh, catching on some of those keyword searches there. And then it's probably benefiting her show, too, at the same time. So uh, win-win for Ellen. Number three was uh, Movie Clips Trailers, certainly a, a big week for trailers with... Uh, all the Comic Con stuff getting released, and I guess The Walking Dead uh, has a new trailer out for season four, which I'm going to check out later today. Now, here's a new one on our list: The Fine Brothers, and they um, what they did is I guess they've done these kids react things. So, Tim, do you, do you know about the, the Fine Brothers? I think they're yeah. a, a revision yeah, three I, I know thing, guys, right? Yeah. So uh, Benny and Rafi Fine have been doing uh, videos for a long time. You might remember them; uh, they did a spoof on Lost with little action figures. And then ABC kind of took that idea, and the Fine Brothers were like, hey, wait a second, you're stealing our idea. And ABC was kind of like, uh, well, this is our show, Lost. And they're like, yeah, but we're doing a parody of your show, and you're stealing our parody. So that was uh, a while back uh, that, that that made some news in the web video world. But the Fine Brothers are great. What they do with Kids React is, is uh, it's again, it's kind of like Candid Camera, if you remember, where... Alan Funt would have the kids come in and then they would watch something or look at something and he would interview them about what they were doing. And it's kind of the same thing here. Uh, The Fine Brothers will show kids a YouTube clip and the kids will react to that clip. They'll, you know, it'll be a viral video or it'll be a YouTuber or, you know, something that's a popular meme on YouTube. And uh, it's it's pretty funny to watch the kids react. And then sometimes they'll do YouTubers react where they'll have I Justine come in and they'll show her a video and she'll react to it. So it's it's really fun to see how people are reacting to when they watch different YouTube videos. And and the Fun Brothers have, have built an audience around this. And uh, Jimmy Kimmel does something similar. He does like these interrogations of kids. Have you ever seen his uh, his stuff? Yeah, yeah. I think we've talked about that on shows in the past. It's great when he you know. He asks the kids, are you, you know, he'll hook them up to a lie detector. And yeah, ask, right. <laughs> are you lying? <laughs> and they get shocked. Yeah, well, they don't get shocked, but a buzzer goes off. Yeah, it is yeah. hysterical. It's fun stuff. You can't go wrong with kids and puppies. I think those are the two things that work really well. So uh, so the Fine Brothers came in at number two, uh, mostly due to their kids react to the, um, con- that, well, I don't think it's controversial, but the uh, Cheerios commercial that raised controversy uh, after all the nuts came out uh, criticizing a uh, uh, a, a, a multiracial family. So, um, Sky does Minecraft is uh, again at number one. And uh, I guess if you, uh, you know, Tim, we got to get into Minecraft. There's there's money in Minecrafting, right? Um, I, I think so. Yeah, it's crazy. Gosh. Um, so here's a good story this week related to online video, uh, which is mostly what we talk about here. Uh, Marissa Meyer is planning to tackle video, and she released her earnings call. And instead of doing a regular conference call, she did it with a in, in a studio via video, um, saying that the company is going to uh, focus on video not only on the content but also providing a platform. And uh, this could, uh, you know, bring some competition to YouTube, which might be good for creators. So, Tim, what are you hearing out there? Anything, any excitement yet, or is it? still too early. Well, it, yeah, I think it's a little bit too early. The thing that, that got a lot of attention was the fact that she put this earnings report out in a video, and it was kind of like a mock news show. I mean, it, it felt 
I don't know, kind of like a college news show, for lack of a better definition. So, kinda, you know, so she wasn't that, that smooth, huh? Well, it, it definitely had a, uh, a YouTuber feel to it, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was Yahoo. Uh, right. I don't know how else to explain it. It, it. it felt a little bizarre, and that's what got attention was the fact that it was kind of bizarre. I may do the earnings call from my basement studio this this month and talk about the uh, two hundred dollars I made. Um, you should you should do it with your your new glasses on. I should do that right with with uh, with the Google Glass watching me to be make it real uh, real meta. Um, and this is something I think uh, you you or I found this week, and maybe we both found it. Hank Green um, says YouTube needs to, and he's kind of repeating the calls that Jason Calacanis and others have made, but uh, repeating the call that YouTube needs better ways to have. Uh, creators engage with their subscribers and uh, from his uh, description on the video he said he spends about 10% of his free time thinking about YouTube which is a, like a lot and I guess it is kind of like a lot. Well he's pretty deep into the YouTube culture I mean Hank Green is one of the Vogue brothers and he's also one of the founders of VidCon which is uh, I think in its fourth year now of uh, you know crazy fan convention where fans come to meet the top YouTubers and this year it's taking place August 1st in Anaheim. And uh, if you've never been, it is surreal. The only thing I can relate it to is when the, you know, the old videos or, or films of the Beatles, you know, being chased by screaming crowds. I mean, literally Shane Dawson will walk into a hotel lobby and, you know, 12, 13-year-old girls just start screaming. And so there'll be all these, you know, preteen and teenage girls that are there with their moms. Occasionally you'll see a dad there, but for the most part it's moms and daughters and, you know, a couple sons, and they're just there for fan worship, you know. And then there's a show floor where they have a trade show set up, and there is some industry stuff that goes on. There's an industry day, the first day of the conference, but then there's autographs, uh, you know, people line up uh, like Comic-Con to get, either their picture or an autograph with their favorite YouTube celebrity. And so it's sold it's, out, it's, right? You can't even get into it right out. now. You, you can't get in. Um, but Industry Day is Thursday, uh, and I'll, I'll be there on Thursday talking about uh, some issues with uh, freedom of speech issues and data capping and that kind of stuff. We have a panel about that. Oh, cool. But uh, anyway, Hank um, is, is really talking about capturing those different... Uh, um, you know, ways that you can capture your, your audience. I mean, Hank also has a t-shirt company that does fulfillment. So, um, you know, it's important that he has uh, access to his fans. And, you know, he'd be somebody really interesting for us to get on the show sometime. Oh, yeah, I'm sure when he's less busy, we should definitely get him on. Because, you know, it seems like if, if he's, you know, certainly if his event is the event to go to, and he's and he's making essentially the, the modern-day equivalent of an open letter um, about uh, the, the business issues uh, around uh, having a channel with subscribers, to, to, especially to the level that he has, that uh, maybe there will be some changes here. And YouTube doesn't usually communicate those changes until they happen. But um, you know, even well, just that, that was that was one of his points was that the fact that they just change things so often that just when you're starting to get something working, it changes and then it messes everything up. And yeah, it makes it really hard to run a business that way. It is very, very hard to run a business that way, and and uh, it's also you know it's it's just a tough environment overall, especially when you're trying to build a community that you really can't communicate with unless they respond to uh, to a video there. So I'm I'm eager to see what what comes out of this and uh, be interesting what kind of interactions he'll have privately probably with YouTube people at VidCon next uh, whenever it happens in the coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, hey, another piece of Rooster Teeth news. They have an uh, animated series now that's only available to paying subscribers. I guess it launched uh, July 18th, according to TubeFilter. Uh, and uh, I, got, I don't know how it's doing, but it looks like it's one of the first um, uh, real transitions from free to paid from a channel that uh, people have grown to uh, trust and love with good content. So uh, we'll see how this thing goes. Are you hearing anything on that, Tim? You know, I haven't heard anything on how it's doing, but, you know, people are being trained to do this. If you look at series like The Walking Dead, right now you can watch season one and season two on Netflix, but if you want to watch season three, you've got to go to a service like iTunes. And um, from what I hear, you know, um, shows like, I, I heard Matt Weiner from Mad Men talking about this, and, you know, he'll get three million uh, views on cable television of a show, he'll get 3 million views on Netflix of a show, and then he'll get an additional 3 million views on iTunes. 
is what he said. So wow. he's, he said he's coming in around 13 million views per episode wow. across everything. That's um, huge. And, and some of that's paid. So, uh, you know, he's definitely making money in cable, and uh, he's making money with Netflix, and then he's making money on iTunes as well. So mm. uh, AMC seems to be doing pretty well with uh, both Mad Men and Walking Dead. So... Uh, they they seem to be the new powerhouse. I mean, their ratings are better than a lot of uh, a lot of broadcast television shows these days. So they're they're really coming out the winner. Yeah, it's huge, huge, huge. And I think maybe having those 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 back episodes available on Netflix and Hulu or whatever. I, mean, I guess Netflix is the, the main driver. Um, having those back episodes there is really helpful because it builds up the audience in the off season that you're you're watching reruns, catching up on this episodic. Uh, content and and being ready to go once the uh, the show re airs. So they're building fans even when they're and making money even when they're not actually running any new content, which is uh, kind of a neat model. And th- I mean, do you, do you think that you know we're seeing so many shows now that are so dependent on you watching the prior episode? You know, a lot of shows used to stand on their own. Every episode was kind of its own little thing. There wasn't an ongoing storyline. But it seems like most of the successful shows now. Uh, are something you really can't just pick up in the middle, right? I mean, is this is this the, the well, net it's, effect it's of it? History, it's history repeating itself. If you look at the early days of television, you had hit shows like The Beverly Hillbillies, My Favorite Martian, um, Gilligan's Island, and all of these were self-contained episodes. Sure, there was maybe an overall arching struggle that was going on. You know, Gilligan needed to get off the island, but each episode was a problem of the week. And I think we're going to see a lot of that now in terms of building audiences so that you don't have to tune in at a specific time. You can catch an episode whenever. You know, you look at The Simpsons, one of the longest-running uh, primetime television shows out there, and that is a problem of the week show that's been very successful. So, sure, you're going to have things like Walking Dead and Mad Men that are story-based and that uh, are episodic, and you really have to know what's going on to enjoy an episode. But I, I think we're, we're going to see a lot of new brands build where they are a problem of the week type show. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, moving on to movies, there's a lot of sequels, speaking of uh, continuing stories. So uh, the weekend uh, has come in. Nikki Fink from uh, Deadline Hollywood there is saying that the, the blockbuster summer movie uh, money has fizzled out a little bit and, and that this week was less than last year's week. So... It uh, looks like uh, maybe people are getting a little tired of the movies again. But uh, number five is Red 2. I don't even know there was a Red 1, but apparently there was with Bruce Willis. So action flick, presumably. Yeah, I, I heard this one's not doing as well as they had expected. But uh, I have heard it's it's fairly good and you know definitely worth watching uh, when it comes to a uh, VOD offering near you. Yeah, so wait for video on that one. Uh, Grown Ups 2 with our uh, Adam Sandler is uh, in at number four this week, so it's uh, it's he's you know those are those are those are easy ones to do, right? Good writing, some good uh, good chemistry with with your your team, and uh, and you can make that work. Uh, number three is a animated flick, Turbo, about a snail that uh, hangs out around a racetrack and apparently gains superpowers to go faster than your average snail. Uh, good for kids, so that's in at number three. Especially if you like uh, Pixar movies, mm. things. Uh, this one is is basically a ripoff of a Pixar film. <laughs> it does. I I watched the trailer and it definitely has a Pixar feel to it. So, uh, it's uh, yeah, but it looks it looks cute. So uh, that's uh, that's in at number three. Despicable Me is that a Pixar film? Um, I I think that's Disney. Um, I can't remember, but I hear it's great. Everybody says go see it. So Despicable Me two is out and at number two for the weekend. So um, lots of. Good kids movies out there, and the first one is not a kids movie. The Conjuring came in. Uh, this is, I think, it's opening weekend, and uh, came in at number one. I think about forty million dollars uh, so far this weekend. So uh, that is uh, the movies that have hit the uh, hit the the theaters this week. And if you're interested, go see one. And uh, not a lot of movie news this week beyond Comic Con. I think that's pretty much where people are uh, going to spend most of their time. I guess, right, Tim? Yeah, so he, he nods yeah, in it. For sure, yeah. Um, it, it, it seems like, you know, there, there are a lot of announcements going on at Comic-Con, and, you know, they're really using that as a leverage board. It will be interesting to see how successful uh, a marketing tool this continues to be for the studios uh, and, you know, and for TV shows. Uh, networks are, are using it as well. You know, Walking Dead has a big presence. Um, so I, I 
I can't tell you if it's going to work yet or not, but, uh, you know, it, the lines are being blurred as to what is film, what is television, and what is a web series. That is very true, and that's actually a story on uh, Media Post this week about uh, will TV become web video before web video becomes TV? And I, I, and I guess there's going to be a kind of a crossover in both directions. Good content is going to find its way into every place it can make money, and I, and I think that might be um, where that goes. So, Well, the, the Lone Ranger was a radio program before it was a TV show, before it was a film. Right. So there you go. Yeah, so it, it, can, it can lead in in all sorts of different but, ways. But I don't know if it's a web series yet. <laughs> I'm sure somebody will come up with uh, that or, or a, a closely matched uh, parody of that. Um, our app of the week this week, Tim, so I, I found something really useful that I had no idea existed, and it's been around for a while. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, bring it up this week because I think other people aren't aware of this either. So um, as you know, we've, we, you and I have become very big fans of Google Plus because it makes doing this show, so it actually makes doing this show even possible because we would not have the time to... Uh, fiddle with all the technical junk uh, if, if we didn't have it. Um, so now I was on uh, my Google Plus app on my iPhone here, and they keep begging me, like, you know, back up your photos and videos to Google Plus. And I'm like, why the hell do I want to do that? And then I look at the, the fine print, and apparently um, it does make your photos smaller when it backs them up, but uh, it doesn't do that to your videos. And if you have a phone or anything, actually, that records video, if it's 15 minutes or less... Uh, you can put those videos on Google Plus automatically or even upload them from your computer. Uh, if it's 15 minutes or less, 1080p or lower, uh, they will store it there for free. So it doesn't and, impact and your storage. Private? And, it is and private. Just, wow. And That's you can sort cool. it. So and I'm thinking... How many, gigs, how many gigs do you get? Unlimited. So if you're... That is crazy. Isn't that crazy? And and I would imagine you can't you know load up your ProRes 444 file or something, but... Uh, if you've got an H.264 encoded video, 1080p uh, or less than 1080p, 15 minutes or less, you can just you can upload to your heart's content. And I think it's a great way to store like old B-roll footage, right? I mean, where else where where else would you put it? it it's uh, it's fantastic. And yeah, I mean, it, you'd have to open up an Amazon account and store it there, right? Right, and pay you know whatever you know they don't charge you all that much, but they still charge you. So um, you can store anything on there. Obviously, they they will hit your storage quota that um, you get. I do. I have like the grandfathered eighty gigs a year thing, but um, you could uh, you know essentially store a bulk of your footage. Uh, you know, again, is a little lower quality. But if you're shooting with like an SLR, you know that's you could take that SLR file if it's under fifteen minutes, throw it out on. Uh, Google Plus, provided it's not a 2K or a 4K file, um, just keep it in there, and the, and it will store the actual file, so it doesn't it doesn't compress it or mush it up. It it is at least from what my testing, it's been the actual file that I uploaded is what I can download. Have you have you had any problems with your ISP going? Hey, you're uploading too much video. Not, What's wrong? Are you stealing things? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. I think that time will come. I was noticing my usage this week has gone up considerably, but what I did do is I had it back up my entire phone. Um, so I, I probably have like 8 or 10, 12 gigs worth of uh, worth of video on there. Uh, another little pro and, tip is that... Doing this from, are you just doing this from your phone in the Google Plus app? I started there, yes, but when I went on this uh, a couple of days ago, I was like, oh, I wonder if I could store some of my B-roll footage up there, and it turns out um, that 15 minutes 1080p thing applies to wherever you upload from. So if you do bring it up from your computer, uh, you can still do it that way. It doesn't have the same like backup functionality, so you kind of have to upload it like you would a photo, but you just don't share it. Um, and then it stays private. Um, you can caption it. Uh, it will also recognize the faces in the video, so you can tag um, the faces that it sees in the video as well. So um, really, uh, really slick little thing. And it's even better than storing it locally, in my opinion, because you can you have all that uh, organizing capability that you might not have otherwise. And you know, I I, I have these issues all the time where I, I you know I take so much, especially these product review things that I do. I take so much footage, and then I'm usually just deleting stuff because I just don't need to store it. But I would like to have a little clip here or there that I could look at along the way. And uh, this is a really, really neat way to do it. So we'll see how long that goes on for. But I, I found it to be uh, infinitely useful uh, in, in backing up uh, video. And it's almost too good to be true. Very cool. So that is uh, very cool. So um, Tim, I think we've uh, covered everything we're going to cover this week. I think our, our app is kind of our topic of the week, um, unless you had something that you wanted to uh, 
Talk well, about one topically. Thing, one, one thing I would like to bring up is uh, the next coming three weeks are the start of Camp Red. And uh, it's really interesting what uh, Red Camera is doing in that they have started a camp for kids, and this will be the third year that they're doing them. Uh, this year it's actually taking place on the Paramount lot. Uh, the last two years it, it took place on Red Lot, but there's, there's actually a Frank uh, Darabont project that's being shot at the Red Studios, and so they don't have any sound stages open, and they've actually had to go to Paramount and rent some sound stages. But it's a summer camp for kids where basically they have kids from, I think, ages 9 to 18 come in, and they give them a red camera and they're like here go shoot something and a lot of stuff really cool. that they shoot are music videos but they'll, they'll also do short films and so uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on it this week and uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what fun stuff they come up with but it, it's, it's a really interesting thing where they're doing this to educate kids on how to use the camera so as they grow older and become filmmakers and a lot of these teenagers that are in um, Camp Red are already film, you know, making films of substance, and some of them are from Russia, some of them are from, you know, the form, former Yugoslavia, Italy, Germany, uh, all over the world they come. And then uh, it looks like this has become so popular that the families want to get involved too. So there could be in the near future a, uh, a Camp Red for families as well. So. Uh, Kind of interesting thing to see how a camera company is, you know, turned into a summer camp, and yeah. uh, they're really educating people on how to use their product, which that, I, I think is a really cool thing. That is really cool. How, is, it, is, is there a cost involved, or is, do they have some scholarships? Yeah, it's, for... uh, it's it, it, they do some scholarships, but it is it is expensive. It's in the thousands of dollars um, to go to camp, but it's not out of line with what you would pay for a normal summer camp for your kid. You know. For a day camp, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not normally sleepover except for the third week. They do rent a uh, a, uh, a camping facility up in the Malibu Mountains and uh, do one week of sleepover camp as well. So they shoot stuff underwater in the pool at camp and and uh, you know shoot campfires and stuff like that. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what all they do this year. That's really cool. When I when I was a kid, I had. Um this is where, how I got into all of this to begin with. So uh, rewind uh, back to 1987 or something. Uh, there was an article in the local paper about this kid who had a cable show on the local cable access channel. And I said, oh, gosh, I got to do that. And they, they offered every summer a, uh, a little cable access uh, week-long camp where you learned how to produce uh, cable access television shows. And I, I had it, you know, 12 or 13 years old, I had a little cable show about... Uh, video games and tech. It's actually the same thing I'm doing now as an adult in my basement, but it's... Uh, it's you, you, and, you and Steve Garfield. We, we should have Steve Garfield oh, we, on the show. You guys can talk about that. He did the same thing when he was a kid. Oh, did he really? I didn't know that because I knew he was the first video blogger, right? But I didn't realize he was... Yeah, uh, yeah he, he was started that. in... Yeah, that, that's kind of where I got my start as well. I interned at a uh, local cable station. And you know, it was funny. That's how like I got so into this stuff because when I when I saw... What YouTube was doing, and Google Video actually was the first thing I was attracted to, um, because remember Google and YouTube used to be separate companies. And what I loved about Google Video was you could just take something, upload it, and uh, as long as you wanted it to be, and and distribute it to the world. And that whole distribution thing was so fascinating to me because it was always so hard to get your cable show produced out beyond where your cable franchise was, especially here in Connecticut where we have like a little tiny state, but we had like 20 different cable systems. Um, so uh, it was just mind blowing to see that happen. So we should explore that a little bit because it'd be kind of neat to uh, have some of us older folks talking about how things used to be. Maybe our our younger audiences will back find in that. the day when I was a video blogger. <laughs> we had VHS and we liked it. So that is uh, that's pretty much all I had for this week, Tim. We will uh, be back again next week, and hopefully we'll have uh, I think we'll have a, uh, we have a couple of good guests lined up um, that we'll we'll be bringing on. Uh, one uh, uh, somebody who I'll have uh, is is a uh, actually, a, a successful uh, musician from the uh, late 70s, early 80s, who is trying to uh, promote his album now in the digital era, and uh, will be really interesting talk. Actually, talking about uh, you know what how things used to be versus how they are now. And I know we have some other folks lined up who were uh, in at Comic Con and didn't have the bandwidth this week, but we will certainly get uh, get some more discussion on there. Tim, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at one Tim Street. 
And you can find me at lonsideman.com or L-O-N-S-E-I-D-M-A-N on Twitter. And that will do it for this week on Behind the Video. We are a wrap. Stories for this episode were compiled by producer Jason Perrier. Follow him on Twitter at J-A-S-O-N-P-E-R-R-I-E-R. Behind the Video is a production of Ape Digital Incorporated and the Independent Media Network, LLC. All rights reserved. 